Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Gokul Ayer from uh, the Pacific Northwest National Laboratories uh, Joint Global Change Research Institute. Um, welcome to the session on um, electricity. Um, so we have, uh, as part of this session, uh, five really exciting talks um, that will uh, cover a variety of topics um, related to power sector and power sector modeling in integrated assessment models. Um, we have Kelly Yurek from uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, John Bisline from um, EPRI, um, Electric Power Research Institute, myself uh, from the Joint Global Change Research Institute, uh, Gang He from uh, Stony Brook University, and Xu Feng uh, Yu from the University of College Cork. Uh, so you can see that we have a, a pretty, um, pretty uh, nice lineup of, of talks. Um, uh, people will talk about uh, you know, renewable integration um, and issues related to storage um, and, and how, you know, integrated assessment models are, are capturing these issues. Uh, we also have, um, you know, a talk that is focused on uh, carbon dioxide rem removal in, in power sector, um, uh, in power sector modeling. And, um, and then we also have, um, you know, talks that are focused on the rapid cost uh, decreases in, um, in renewables and how that is affecting um, the, the deployment and, and, and the evolution of the power sector uh, into the future. Uh, let me remind the audience that you're welcome to post questions. Uh, you can use the chat or the Q&A um, feature, um, but, but, but I prefer that if, that if people use the Q&A uh, feature for posting questions, that would be easier uh, to monitor and, um, and um, uh, you know, you know, bro broadcast them to, to the speakers themselves. So with not much further ado, let me um, turn the stage to Kelly uh, from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, who will talk about the challenges and opportunities uh, for renewable energy uh, integration in integrated assessment models. Kelly, the stage is yours. Thank you, Gokul. Um, so my presentation includes contributions from my colleagues at NREL, as well as contributions from collaborators at PNNL, as well as the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, so I just want to acknowledge those collaborators initially. So to start with an overview, um, you know, we, we are seeing more and more demand from IAMs to become better predictions, including you know, modeling scenarios with transformational changes, such as high penetration RE in the electric sector. And so some of the questions um, that come up are, what do these scenarios look like? And how quickly can some of these changes occur? And there's a lot of technical complexity um, in high penetration RE modeling, and it's very challenging. And so my goal today is to kind of encourage improvements in the representation of variable RE through two-way modeling exchanges. On one hand, you have communities with detailed um, regional sector-specific models and other communities with coarse global multi-sector models. And so the question is, um, what can these two communities learn from each other? And so we kind of explore this through some U.S. focused analyses um, to identify opportunities for some of this cross-model collaboration and improvement. Um, first, by looking at a cursory examination of modeling results from IAMs, and second, through uh, a formal harmonization exercise. So I'll start by looking at um, this cursory examination of model reference cases of electricity generation for the U.S. in 2050, as shown in this figure. And there's a lot we could talk about here, um, but this figure can help generate some good ideas about model behaviors. And so each column represents a model scenario. The three bars on the left are from the national policy scenarios from CD Links from three different IAMs. And the figures on the right are some mid-case scenarios from NRO modeling, uh, what we call the standard scenarios. And these are derived from a detailed power sector model called REEDS. And so we expect some differences in these results due to differences in kind of scenario input data, um, difference in methods and difference in model resolution. Um, but we should note that models like Message and Remind are executed as global models with a single region for the US, whereas GCAM USA is a special version of GCAM with state level re resolution. And so, um, and then the NREL model is, has 134 regions for the US and it's focused primarily on the, on the electric sector. And the three IAMs you know, have multi-sectors, considerations for energy, agriculture, land use, and water whereas the NREL model is only electric sector and has some basic considerations for energy, water, and land nexus. So each scenario has a unique insight into the power sector evolution, 
but I'm going to argue that no scenario is correct given the amount of uncertainty in the, the next 30 years, 2050. But you know, even if we look at the NREL results in isolation, we notice that there's been changes um, year over year in our modeling. And so this is an interesting perspective in analyzing scenario differences from kind of bottom up models. Um, you know, things like technology costs, fuel prices and demand can drive some of these changes. You know, each year we're making improvements to how we parameterize our reintegration, so that could drive some of the changes. Um, you know, and, and just recent developments in battery storage modeling that could support something like PV deployment, as you would see in the, the 2020 NREL modeling, we have the highest amount of PV. So these are just some of the kind of few points of, of why there might be differences, even on the, the NREL side of things. Um, but, you know, if we look at, you know, seed links versus NREL, you know, we see a lot of similarities and a lot of differences in both supply and demand. Um, and this initial inspection kind of raises a lot of questions. You know, which of these model behaviors from the reference cases might be magnified in some of these transformative scenarios, especially with high penetration RE? And so on this next slide, um, I pulled some more scenarios from CD links to kind of, you know, ask some more interesting questions in these kind of transformative scenarios. You know, in a model like message, you know, you see on the far left that, you know, there's kind of static wind deployment um, going from 2C to 1.5C. And you see you know, a bit of reliance on nuclear power and a little bit of biomass as well. And so it kind of raises questions of you know, biomass competition for, for power and, and other sources. Looking at Remind, um, we see you know, a decline in, in wind deployment um, going from 2C to 1.5C. And that's being kind of taken up by um, a large amount of solar deployment. And so this kind of raises questions about you know, what's the, the viability of that amount of solar? You know, is there storage to support that? Um, what, what other mechanisms are in play um, for that renewable integration? And then looking at uh, GKM USA, and you know, again, there's there's a bit of uh, nuclear um, reliance in the 1.5C in addition to some wind and solar. And so again, is there public perceptance issues about nuclear? Um, you know, and, and you know, 58% renewable penetration. You know, what are the challenges there? Um, sorry. So. You know, and some other some other questions that arise from looking at some of these comparisons is, you know, which which of these model outcomes are, are technically feasible, and what are some of the real world constraints that are in, insufficiently captured in the models, especially renewable integration, and you know, why are the differences in the reference cases? Um, why are the differences in these two degrees C and one point five degrees C cases? And you know, are there ways that we can try to harmonize the models given kind of the underlying methodological uncertainties in the different models? And you know what kind of level of consistency can we expect? And so from here, I'd like to transition to some work that was done by NREL and PNNL to kind of harmonize some of the model inputs to kind of reconcile some of these differences. So you know, in this study, um, we're trying to measure the consistency in, in model electricity generation under you know cross-model harmonization through an ensemble of scenarios from PNNL's GCAM USA and NREL's Reed's electric sector model. And so we developed a design experiment for this harmonization as shown in this figure. On the far left, you have six scenarios with varying model inputs, um, a reference scenario, some techno technological innovation scenarios, fossil fuel prices, and low carbon scenarios. In the middle, you have kind of four levels of harmonization. One, you have no harmonization. Um, two, you have kind of one way passing the information from one model to the other. And then you have kind of a two way harmonization of information is going back and forth between both models. And so to evaluate some of this consistency, um, we're using a taxi cab norm metric um, to kind of measure the distance in changes in electricity generation between the models. And so this table shows um, these resulting norms for each of these 24 scenarios, the, the six kind of scenarios times the four harmonization attempts. And so the expectation here is that harmonization might improve consistency in model outputs. Um, and the, the consistency, you know, if you have a lower number in this table, that means you have more consistent outputs, whereas a higher number is, is less consistent. And, but the study finds that it's not always the case that, that you will have consistency as you try to harmonize. And so that's an important outcome um, when considering multi-model um, collaboration. And so just to kind of give you um, one taste of this, in a scenario where we harmonize the renewables and retirement inputs between the two models, you know, five out of the six 
um, scenarios show improvement in, in the consistency between um, GCAM and reads. So again, um, some challenges here in trying to harmonize even reference case um, scenarios and, and some of these other sensitivities. But, but I would say overall, this modeling collaboration between um, NREL and, and PNNL is, is kind of a, a blueprint for, for multi-model collaboration that could occur in the future with IAM teams. You know, IAM teams could kind of collaborate with MREL to kind of distill these high resolution power sector data and then try to incorporate them into the models. The IAM teams could, could learn directly from what um, you know, GCAM has done and their techniques. Um, or they could also collaborate with PNNL to kind of compare approaches for doing country-specific um, modeling of, of these transformation scenarios. I think I'm running low on time, so kind of just wrap things up. Um, you know, so we did some comparisons and harmonizations between IAMs and, and uh, energy sector models. And, you know, there's some differences that are revealed that might be important in improving the representation of um, variable renewable technologies. And, you know, and we recommend this kind of continuous two-way dialogue between these modeling teams to kind of strengthen the understanding of the key roles of these technologies in these future scenarios. And so we could be looking at ways to reconcile differences in model structures, um, the temporal and spatial resolution. I'm starting to have these discussions about specific countries and, and how those evolutions look, thinking about the feasibility of PV and wind, um, as well as kind of the feasibility of renewable deployment rates. Um, so with that, I will conclude my presentation. And uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks, Kelly. That was a smooth, um, smooth presentation. Um, let me look at the Q and A part here. Um, any questions for Kelly? Please post them on the Q and A uh, section. Okay. While well, while well, people are are potentially typing questions, I have one question for you. Um, so you were mentioning, you know, collaborative efforts between different modeling, uh, di different modeling capabilities, and, and you highlighted one collaboration that, um, you know, we've done with, with GCAM USA and, and NREL, um, and NREL's read, uh, reads model, um, which, which I think was a very, a very learning, uh, very deeply learning experience, um, having gone through that exercise myself and, and participated in that exercise. Um, I wonder if you could, um, you know, um, throw some light on uh, potential collaborations in the future um, on issues um, that matter uh, between, um, you know, NREL's like uh, capabilities in terms of, um, you know, NREL helps us really you know, like sector specific and sector focused models, right? And, and uh, especially has some expertise in, um, in modeling of, for example, storage or, um, uh, you, you know, materials and, and so forth. So, uh, could you could you speak to some some of those um, some of those potential other collaborations um, you know NREL can uh, bring um, or, or foster with the IAM community? Sure, um, good question. So you know when thinking about the electric power sector, it's not only about um, just the supply side technologies like wind and solar and and kind of the challenges of integration, but also just thinking about the things like the demand side and you know the role of electrification. Um, and how that could play into renewable integration and transformations in the future and, and thinking about um, the different, you know, residential, commercial, industrial um, mobility and, and, and how, you know, demand for these different services as electrification might happen. Um, and so we've done a lot of different studies recently um, kind of on demand side changes through electrification um, and the kind of potential for that and, and, and how you start to um, collaborate renewable energy with um, electrification of, of end uses. Um, so that's definitely an area. Um, transportation evolution, not only for electrification, but also using alternative fuels. Um, you know, so there, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, a broader scope beyond just the power sector supply side technologies that, that need to be addressed um, in some of these collaborations. Um, and so I think those are um, areas we could focus on. Uh, thanks, Kelly. So, uh, I have one question. I have two, two questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to pick one for now, and then um, you know take uh, the remaining uh, during the discussion uh, section of the end of the session. Um, so this is from uh, Professor Marta uh, Victoria. Um, can you discuss the time resolution used in the IAMs and reads model? How did uh, how do you think this is affecting the results? That's a good question. Um, so typically the IAMs have 
you have some coarser resolution. I know that GCAM USA, I believe, has um, somewhere around 12 time slices potentially, but generally when you're running these global models, um, there could be even less than that. The Reads model has 16 kind of time slices for dispatch, looking at you know a representative day of each season and the different times of day. So you're trying to capture those um, dynamics between you know matching um, solar and, and, and wind output with, with demand. And so being able to capture those dynamics is going to help you understand the renewable integration challenges. Um, and some of those might be missed in these in these um, global IAM models. And so you kind of have to do some um, you know, work up front to parameterize some of those um, hourly or sub-hourly dynamics that can't be captured. Right. And and just, just to clarify a little bit, um, since I was a co-author on that paper uh, that you presented, Kelly, um, you know, one of the goals for of, the, of our harmonization exercise was to try and avoid uh, disrupting the fundamental structures of the models themselves um, and try to find uh, ways to harmonize the models, um, the two models, um, to, to the best possible uh, uh, without just, you know, we wanted to draw a, we wanted to draw a fine line between, um, you know, just doing, you know, the standard approaches of of um, of how the inter the integrated assessment modeling community uh, harmonizes models, which is to you know harmonize population and GDP and technology assumptions. We did those, but in addition, we wanted to take some efforts to um, also try and um, you know reparameterize some of the uh, some of the uh, structures in uh, in the two models uh, without really disturbing or disrupting the fundamental structures themselves. Um, and so, you know, GCAM has a four, uh, the, the version that was used in the study has a four segment or a four time slice version, uh, whereas reads has 17 time slices. So we made a translation from the, the, the 17 to the four uh, when we were trying to, um, to, to harmonize, the, uh, harmonize the, the load profile uh, definitions. Um, yeah, so, so, so it, it was a nice, nice learning experience for, for both teams. And, and uh, I encourage uh, viewers um, and, and the audience to, to read. Uh, the, the couple of papers that came out of that exercise, one, uh, the one that was presented by Kelly and the other one uh, led by myself, both of them in um, uh, renewable, sustainable uh, energy reviews. Okay, so with that, uh, let's move on to the second talk by John Biskline from uh, the Electric Power uh, Research Institute. Um, so this is going to be a pre-recorded video, but we do have John here online for um, for answering questions. Okay. Everyone, I'm John Beislein from the Electric Power Research Institute, and on behalf of my co-authors Jeff Blanford and Tom Wilson, we appreciate the opportunity to share our research today. So there's three related motivations for our work. Uh, the framing is around reaching net zero uh, emissions targets in the electric sector. And the first is uh, different countries and subnational entities that have targeted net zero emissions, uh, many in the 2050 timeframe. And in the US, President-elect Biden has called for 100% clean electricity by 2035. Uh, so there's questions about the implications of this accelerated timeframe, which we'll try to answer. Uh, a second motivating question is, uh, to what degree do renewables-focused uh, decarbonization strategies differ from technology-neutral pathways? And third, uh, there are debates about the role of carbon removal technologies, like bioenergy with carbon capture, on electric uh, sector decarbonization. So we conducted a new analysis to help to understand these questions. How does the target framing and timing matter? Uh, how does the availability of carbon removal impact uh, planning outcomes? Uh, and so the focus here is on the U.S., but I think many of the insights are transferable uh, elsewhere, which I'll try to highlight as we go along. So when we think about electric sector targets, there are different possible interpretations of zero emissions that have pretty strong impacts on what decarbonization could mean. In part, this boils down to which technologies are available. Uh, so to the left here is the most expansive definition of zero. Uh, net zero can include not only renewables and nuclear, but also allows for technologies like carbon capture uh, and some fossil to remain in the mix, which could allow uh, for negative emissions technologies and to offset the positive uh, residual emissions. Uh, this is the, the least cost approach and also uh, involves the greatest number of eligible resources. The second definition is carbon-free, where only zero-emitting uh, resources would be eligible. 
Uh, this takes CCFs off the table either due to the strict definition of zero uh, or to other issues like permitting that could keep CCS from being a viable technology. And uh, to the right is the most restrictive set, 100% uh, renewables. Uh, this doesn't include nuclear, doesn't include CCS. Uh, basically, 100% of generation comes from eligible renewables. And so for some audiences, uh, zero means 100% renewables. So our analysis looks at six uh, different scenarios, uh, reaching zero with these three target definitions by 2035, uh, and then scenarios uh, going to 2050. So to investigate these questions, uh, we use our U.S. Regent model of the air and energy. So there's a few key features of the electric sector model to point out. Uh, so it's making simultaneous decisions about capacity planning, uh, transmission, dispatch, uh, all maintaining hourly correlations between load, uh, wind output, and solar output. It has uh, pretty detailed uh, spatial and temporal resolutions, and here we're using an 8760 hourly resolution, given the importance of different forms of energy storage. Uh, so both models are, are supported uh, by EPRI engineering expertise and uh, technology projections. I can find more information both about the model and some recent papers on our website. So uh, what would the mix look like uh, to get to these targets? This slide shows the current mix uh, in 2020, an existing policies reference in 2035, and then the three uh, zero emission scenarios. And so, uh, yeah, these three uh, cases are pretty different from uh, either today's uh, grid uh, or, or, or the reference, uh, but it's pretty striking how different the three zero emission scenarios are. So in the first case, the net zero case, uh, negative emissions technologies like bioenergy with CCS, uh, it's fairly modest in generation terms, but it enables uh, some positive emissions from gas here in orange um, to supplement increases in renewables. So we have wind here in green <clears throat> and solar here in uh, yellow at the, the top. So renewables are over 50% of the system. Uh, once you include hydro down here in blue, uh, existing nuclear in gray stays online, but there's no uh, new nuclear additions in this scenario. So this is the least cost way to, to get to zero uh, with the most expansive uh, definition. Uh, so moving on to only carbon-free uh, resources, this takes CCS off the table, and instead you have a more rapid build-out of nuclear in gray and uh, renewables. So the share of wind and solar is roughly two-thirds uh, of the mix, but there's also a pretty big increase uh, in hydrogen uh, as well. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> hydrogen is used as a longer duration storage option and to provide firm capacity. So, when we uh, move to the last case uh, here, uh, wind and solar represent 92% of the mix. Uh, there's firm capacity from both hydrogen uh, and battery storage here at the top. Uh, but, uh, again, this figure is just showing a discharge. The capacity picture will show how these combine to provide uh, firm capacity, uh, although there are still questions about uh, reliability and resilience in any of these scenarios, since our modeling here is only ensuring uh, hourly uh, balancing. But uh, you can see how total generation uh, also increases in this scenario due to uh, round-trip losses. from. Uh, another implication here is that uh, there's lower electrification, uh, which are the black bars here, uh, with a more restrictive definition uh, as uh, electricity price uh, increases feedback on end-use decisions. Uh, so this, of course, influences the degree of decarbonization uh, elsewhere in the economy. So these definitions uh, of zero by 2035 have important uh, impacts on cost as well. Here we're showing the average generation price in the vertical axis, which includes the generation and cross-regional transmission uh, component to support renewables but doesn't include uh, the T&D component in retail prices here. Uh, so there's a modest increase in the net zero case in green uh, relative to the reference here in black. Basically, BEX provides a buffer to help to manage costs. Uh, we also have run cases with direct air capture, but the insights are directionally uh, consistent, so I'm not showing those here. Uh, the carbon-free line in blue reflects a, a large push for new investments in renewables and nuclear capacity. Uh, alongside retirements of existing coal and, and gas, uh, which leads to uh, to the price spike we see uh, here. Uh, it's basically more than a doubling relative to the reference in, in 2035, but then it uh, decreases after that. 
The 100% renewables case is higher still uh, due to the extensive capacity rollout, which I'll show in a couple of slides. But the main takeaway here is that restricting the technology choice sets can increase decarbonization costs, uh, which by itself isn't surprising, though I think the magnitudes here are, are pretty informative. So uh, if you have the flexibility uh, to uh, extend the timing out to 100% uh, by 2050 and meeting 80% uh, by, by 2035, uh, this sort of flexibility can provide a cost buffer, as we see in the dotted lines. Uh, basically, the price impacts are more gradual, uh, and the peak uh, 2050 isn't quite as high since technology developments have helped to uh, bring costs down in, in the interim. Uh, so if you want to get to zero faster, it, of course, requires additional options beyond just uh, wind, solar, batteries, and gas, uh, especially uh, once you get beyond uh, 80%. Uh, the mixes uh, 2050 would be pretty similar uh, to what you see in 2035. So there's an important uh, regional story uh, with underlying these scenarios as well. Uh, this slide shows cost impacts for the zero uh, scenarios for four regions in the U.S. And so the West and the Midwestern uh, U.S. have higher quality wind and solar resources. So the impacts of more restricted uh, technology portfolios are, are more limited here in the bottom. Uh, but the south and eastern U.S. are impacted more by constrained uh, technology choice sets. You can see the price spikes are, are larger for both the carbon-free case and the 100% uh, renewables case as well. So to uh, summarize the large uh, changes across scenarios, this slide shows capacity investments over the next 15 years. And there's a significant acceleration in investments and dependence on emerging technologies in basically all zero-target scenarios. Uh, this is especially true relative to historical uh, builds over the last 15 years, uh, or even in comparison to a, to a reference case with current policies. Uh, we also see uh, retirements uh, beneath the axis, basically coal retires regardless, but the degree of gas uh, retirements varies. <clears throat> so the total uh, new additions and expenditures, uh, which are at the very top, uh, look uh, more daunting as we move to more and more restricted uh, definitions of zero, uh, moving to the right. So there's a 50% increase uh, in the, from the net zero case to the carbon free case uh, and a doubling uh, to the 100% renewables case. So we, uh, we really see the value of carbon removal technologies uh, here. So overall, uh, we see a lot of renewables and storage in all cases and clearly there are market design, uh, regulatory and, and permitting challenges uh, as well. Uh, don't have time uh, though to talk through some of those today. So in summary, I think the key uh, takeaways here are that restricting uh, technology options uh, increases the cost of electric sector decarbonization uh, relative to the net zero formulation, uh, which highlights the, the value of even modest uh, carbon uh, removal deployment. And so we saw that targeting 80% by 2035 uh, allows for more gradual introduction of new technology and tends to dampen uh, price spikes. Uh, and then I guess the third bullet is uh, sort of a uh, high-level comment that uh, collaboration uh, in areas like R&D, technology strategy, um, are essential in any of these scenarios to help to overcome challenges with reaching uh, zero emissions targets in the electric sector. Uh, but I would say these challenges are especially important to, to think through uh, when you're uh, considering more accelerated uh, uh, timeframes. So uh, thanks for your attention, and I'll look forward to your questions. Thanks, John. That was a uh, that was a fantastic talk. Um, let me look at the Q and A um, portion here for any questions. So while people are typing their questions, um, I have one for you, uh, jo John. Let me make sure you're you're here. Yep, I'm still here. Great. Okay. Uh, very quick question. Um, maybe I missed it in the presentation. Um, so, what's the? Uh, did, did, did your modeling also include some um, negative emissions technologies like um, you know bioenergy in, in combination with CCS um, and 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 potentially other uh, technologies like DAC, um, direct air capture? Um, if not, do you have plans to incorporate them in your analysis going forward? Thanks. That's a great question. So with the, uh, the few scenarios I showed today, uh, those focus just on bioenergy uh, with carbon capture, uh, but we have uh, run scenarios too uh, with direct air capture. Um, and so 
yeah, obviously those two are, are sort of different in the incentives you would need to sort of provide to, to see them deploy, but uh, also in the sense that, you know, direct air capture uh, consumes uh, electricity and, and heat, of course, is an important factor input, uh, whereas, you know, with BEX, uh, it generates electricity. Uh, but yes, we've, we've incorporated uh, both in our modeling, but here I'm just showing the results with, uh, with BEX. Excellent. Okay. Um, any questions for John from the audience? Please post them in the Q&A section. Oh, okay. Um, I see one question from uh, Lara. Um, thank you very much uh, for the interesting presentation. I was wondering if you did a sensitivity analysis of the techno-economic parameters underlying the uh, electricity generators. If so, um, were there notable changes in the outcomes? Is there an overview of which parameters you considered? So the question is about any sensitivity analysis in particular uh, related to, um, I guess, cost assumptions and other technical parameters. Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. And uh, and yes, we, we did run a number of sensitivities. I, I didn't get a time to uh, get a time to talk through those today. Uh, there's a backup slide that sort of shows the capital cost estimates, but, you know, whenever you're thinking about these deep decarbonization scenarios, you know, it's not just the capital costs that matter. There's a range of, of other costs throughout the system. Uh, but, you know, those are an important driver. Uh, so we run sensitivities to, uh, to different uh, cost trajectories for renewables, for nuclear, for BECs. Uh, nuclear and BECs tend to be higher costs uh, with, within our modeling. But... I think an important question, of course, is how these costs come down over time and how uh, sort of policy uh, can, can affect those costs. And I think this is one great area where uh, global IAMs and the national models uh, can sort of interact with one another. And really, you know, look at a portrait of global uh, deployment of different technologies and capture, you know, depending on uh, how many factors your learning curve might have, uh, how those costs uh, come down. Um, so that's something that, you know, here with the national model, we sort of use our EPRI expertise and uh, sort of loosely uh, calibrated look, think about how uh, global deployment uh, may have sort of uh, spillovers in, in the U.S. Uh, in terms of cost declines. Um, but, yeah, that's a, it's a great, great question. Great. Thanks, John. Um, so in the interest of time, let's move on uh, to the next talk, which will be by uh, myself. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay, um, let me make sure people are able to see my presentation. How do I control that? Okay, okay. I um, can't really read through my, okay, that's going to be a little bit, little bit hard, but I'm going to try. Um, okay, welcome everyone. My, my name is um, Gokul Iyer. Um, hello again. Um, so I will be talking about insights from improved uh, power sector modeling in um, the, the global change analysis uh, model, uh, which is the flagship model um, that is developed and maintained at the Joint Global Change uh, Research Institute um, uh, here, here in Maryland, uh, United States. Um, so just to motivate the, the talk, um, let me introduce... Uh, let me introduce the the talk, and and, and I'll be I'll be up front here that I'm not able to really see my uh, my my uh, slides as I'm presenting them. Uh, it's a little bit weird, uh, so please excuse me if I if I'm not uh, totally coherent. Uh, anyway, um, so as we all know, electricity demand varies continuously uh, with pronounced um, uh, seasonal and daily uh, patterns, um, and you know, and and as a result of that, electricity supply needs to be uh, synchronized uh, with, with demand as well. And so electricity supply also needs to uh, vary continuously uh, with demand. Uh, from the perspective of planners, uh, planners plan to have sufficient capacity of dispatchable uh, power to meet uh, peak demands so that you know, the rest of the, uh, during rest of the demands, um, su supply is able to match demand um, uh, perfectly. Um, now, many human and natural stressors could affect the character of power sector uh, investments and the evolution of the power sector. Um, however, for the purposes of this presentation and for you know, motivating uh, you know, some of the model capability developments that we've undertaken uh, in the last uh, several years uh, here at Degree, we have focused on temperature uh, change and variability. 
So the main research question for our um, uh, for for um, in our presentation today, um, and and also more broadly for for the work we've been doing uh, in the last couple of years in terms of power sector uh, modeling uh, within within uh, the global change uh, analysis model, um, is you know how does long term temperature change and its spatial and temporal variability affect uh, electric sector uh, capacity requirements in uh, the United States? Uh, before I move on, I'm just going to quickly check the chat section to make sure uh, that people are, are, are comfortable with my presentation. It look, looks like things are working. Great. OK. Um, so our work really builds on a lot of previous work um, that has gone into answering uh, this question. Uh, in particular, um, you know, previous work from the integrated assessment modeling community as part of the advanced um, multi-model um, exercise. Um, uh, and, and also several, um, you know, several studies that have used econometric uh, and empirical methods, um, and also studies from uh, power sector uh, focused tools. Um, however, it, you know, our work addresses three main uh, modeling gaps. Firstly, um, studies that are based on multi-sector uh, models, um, like like uh, integrated assessment models, typically focus on annual electricity demands without capturing. Uh, the effects of temperature change at sub at subannual uh, scales. Um, in particular, uh, you know, exercises such as the advanced um, uh, you know multi-model exercise uh, was focused on improving uh, renewable integration um, and improving subannual dynamics on the supply side, but not really on the on the demand side. Um, secondly, studies that use econometric and empirical methods. Uh, typically do not account for changes in uh, socioeconomics, technology, and infrastructure uh, over time. So these studies typically assume, uh, uh, you know, fixed um, uh, or, or static uh, view of the, of the future, typically. Um, of, and and these studies are, are really helpful to glean insights about the impacts of temperature change on um, investment requirements. Um, however, uh, you know, uh, the considerations of, of uh, evolving socioeconomics and technology and infrastructure um, uh, could be important in, in gleaning uh, or more nuanced and robust insights. Thirdly, studies that use um, power sector focused tools do not account for multi sector uh, interactions, including uh, interactions uh, between supply and demand uh, of electricity, and also interactions um, such as you know, the competition of, of various fuels, including electricity and gas, to serve uh, certain end use uh, demands. And so we wanted to. Um, you know, try and address these uh, these these main uh, modeling gaps in our work, um, and to that end, we um, used the global change analysis uh, model, um, in particular the U.S. specific version uh, of this model. Um, so, most people uh, here in the audience uh, probably know, uh, but just as a quick refresher, uh, GCAM is a dynamic recursive uh, economic uh, equilibrium model. It simultaneously and consistently resolves uh, energy, agriculture, uh, land use, and water markets in 32 geopolitical regions in the globe. Uh, GCAM USA, which is a US specific version of GCAM, breaks down the United States further into 50 states and the District of Columbia. Uh, so so the, the United States uh, and the 50 states uh, within the US uh, and DC are housed within the global version of the model so that conditions um, and prices, supplies, and demands within the U.S. are uh, consistent with uh, conditions um, globally. Now, using GCAM USA, um, we uh, you know we made uh, several uh, capability improvements to address our uh, core research question of trying to understand the impacts of long-term temperature change and variability uh, on power sector uh, investments uh, and operations. Um, so the inputs, the key inputs to our improved model uh, include hourly temperature and annual uh, population, GDP, technology, and and uh, and other uh, and other uh, host of host of other uh, input assumptions that that are are consistent with the previous versions of our uh, of our model. Um, we then in we, we then went ahead and separated um, electricity uh, demand uh, uh, for for for. For for uh, many services, uh, in particular cooling and and heating, um, and also for industry and and transport, into twenty five segments. Um, so namely, we we um, we, we uh, divided every service demand into twenty four monthly 
day and night, um, and also a super peak segment that corresponds to uh, the 10 uh, coldest hours uh, in a year. Um, so we incorporated load profiles into, uh, into our various services, uh, uh, end use services within GCAM USA. And uh, one key feature is that these load profiles also uh, vary across uh, the United States. Uh, so, so different regions, multi-state grid regions within the US would have different uh, load profile uh, shapes. The second capability improvement we made um, was to incorporate um, you know, the ability for capacity to be dispatched in these 25 segments to meet demand in each of these, uh, uh, in, in each of these segments um, based on a, a least variable cost uh, merit order. And this is consistent with uh, the philosophy and the approach that many optimization uh, models um, that, that uh, especially more uh, optimization models uh, use. And uh, finally, we also incorporated the capability for uh, new capacity investments to be based on um, the, the demand in the super peak segment. Uh, so just as a reminder, the super peak segment corresponds to the, the 10 top hours with the maximum uh, load within the, within the year. And that, that corresponds to the 10 coldest hours uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the year. And so uh, new capacity requirements in our improved model um, are based on um, uh, you know, the demand in that, in that super peak segment, in addition to considerations of relative costs and uh, existing capacity and uh, retirements. Um, the output uh, from our improved uh, model include uh, you know, monthly day, day, day and night, um, electricity, uh, electricity uh, load by service, uh, we have uh, peak and mean electricity loads, um, electricity capacity by technology, and also monthly day and night uh, electricity generation by uh, technology. So, so as you can see here, we're, we're, uh, we've, we've undertaken some improvements in the past years that push us, you know, push the boundaries in terms of what we've been doing so far in terms of, our, in terms of power sector modeling uh, within the GCAM team of trying to, you know, move from annual uh, dynamics to more uh, subannual and hourly uh, dynamics. So moving on, um, you know, to, to answer our specific question, we've taken um, gridded hourly temperature data to calculate um, uh, population rated state level cooling and heating degree hours. Um, and these are, this data are represented in the, in the form of maps uh, in this, in the slide. Uh, you can see cooling degree hours and heating degree hours. Uh, and we've also shown a uh, mean and peak uh, cooling degree hours and, and heating degree uh, hours. A couple of things stand out from these maps. First is that the climatic conditions are really different across the United States. And also the evolution of time, evolution over time uh, is pretty, um, uh, pretty starkly different and heterogeneous across uh, the United States, both for uh, cooling degree hours as well as uh, heating degree um, hours. And so using this data, we, we explore two uh, scenarios. Uh, the first is the RCP 8.5, uh, with temperature impacts on load profiles. And by the way, the, the maps show uh, uh, heating degree and cooling degree hours for RCP 8.5. Um, and the second, um, uh, second scenario we explored in the study um, is uh, RCP 8.5 without any temperature impacts on uh, load profiles. Um, now under RCP 8.5, uh, what we observed was that the impact of temperature change on the peak load is greater uh, than the mean. So the maps here, um, there are two maps here. The, the, the first map shows uh, the mean uh, load and the second one shows the peak. And these are ratios um, of loads in 2100 um, in the RCP 8.5 with temperature impacts to load in RCP 8.5 without temperature impacts. Um, as we can see, for example, in California, the, the temperature induced increase in load is um, in mean load is just 15 percent, whereas the temperature induced increase in the peak load is 25 percent. And the reason for this discrepancy is that you know these temperature induced increases in mean cooling demand can be offset by decreases in uh, mean heating demand because there's an averaging effect. However, when we're talking about the peak loads, uh, the temperature induced increases in peak cooling demands do not get offset by decreases in um, in peak heating demands, uh, simply because they occur at different points in, in time. So this uh, differential impact of temperature on mean and peak load is manifested in, in terms of uh, generation and installed capacity. 
Um, so we all recognize that generation is, is electricity generation. Annual electricity generation correlates or tracks better with a mean or average um, load in, in a given year, whereas capacity tracks better with the peak load uh, in, in a given year. And that's how we are, we are modeling it. And so the impact of temperature um, is a 5% increase in generation by the end of the century, whereas it's a 15% increase uh, in capacity uh, by the end of the century. Uh, these impacts are also different by state. Um, um, the temperature-induced impacts on, on uh, cumulative investments uh, would, would vary across states depending on you know, resource availability, prices. Um, for example, uh, there's more wind investments in the Midwest, uh, whereas states like Texas, where gas prices are lower, see more gas investments. Um, and, and one thing to, to, to note here is that you know, some of the temperature-induced increases in capacity and in investments uh, could also be used to supply the increased demand in other states um, because we have a, a representation of, of trade. And so not all, the, not all the increases in capacity and investments correspond to uh, only uh, own state um, in increases in, in, in demand. Uh, they could be used to supply demands in other state um, as well. Um, so just before moving on uh, to, the, to my concluding slide, I would note that the study is, is uh, in press uh, in Nature Communications, uh, and, I, uh, uh, and I encourage uh, viewers to, to uh, take a look at the paper uh, when they get a chance. So uh, in conclusion, um, I would like to uh, talk about some of the ongoing and future work that we are undertaking at the Institute to in improve our uh, power sector modeling in GCAM further. Um, first off, we are working to incorporate better uh, capacity market dynamics, uh, wherein uh, you know, dispatchable capacity uh, receives a full capacity credit, whereas intermittent capacity would receive a diminishing capacity credit um, as penetration increases. We're also improving our representation of retirements um, to um, you know, be based uh, on explicit comparison of cost of operating old with cost of replacing and operating new uh, power plants. And finally, uh, so, uh, uh, ongoing work and, and future work will, will focus heavily on storage and incorporating storage issues into our modeling. Um, we are in storage technologies, uh, including batteries and pumped hydro and so forth. At the same time, we are also interested in uh, different types of storage. Um, you know, one type of storage where there's ability to generate during cheaper off-peak times and sell during peak hours. Um, and the second type of storage where um, we, we, we would have, uh, you know, excess renewable output um, being stored uh, to avoid uh, curtailment. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions from the audience. Okay, I see one question from uh, Dr. Gang He, who will be presenting later. I, I guess he's going next. Um, very interesting work. Do you consider the impact on power system operation? Yes. Um, so... We, we do we do have some impacts on power sector operation as I as I uh, mentioned during uh, during the talk uh, you know in capacity that is invested upon is also uh, dispatched according to a least cost uh, merit order um, which is the algorithm that most optimization models uh, use um, it was a pretty pretty interesting um, thing to do in, in within GCAM framework which is not optimization. Uh, based, but rather partial equilibrium based. And so we use the lessons that we learned from optimization tools uh, to do that. Uh, but fortunately for us, you know, we just had to, it was a simple sorting routine that we had to uh, incorporate in our code. And so it didn't really affect our solution, uh, solution time. So the answer is yes, we do consider uh, power sector operation as well. Okay, one question from Kelly. Uh, do you consider the impacts of temperature change on supply side technologies? Uh, the answer is for this particular study, we have not done so, uh, but we are uh, in the process of, of um, uh, so there is a paper we are, we, we are writing uh, that is under review um, and uh, th that, consider, uh, that considers impacts of temperature change and climate change on um, renewable supplies, um, you know, the, the renewable potentials and so forth. So we, we are uh, doing a separate study uh, on that, but not, not as part of this, this particular uh, study. This one just focused on, you know, impact of temperature change on load profiles and associated impacts on um, capacity investments and uh, power sector electricity generation. 
Okay, so in the interest of time, I think we can move on. Uh, the next presentation will be by uh, Dr. Gang He, who has uh, given a pre-recorded uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Gang He. Uh, of energy policy in the Department of Technology and Society at the Stony Brook University. It is a great pleasure to take the opportunity to share our recent work. My presentation is based on a collaborative work with Dr. Ning Jiang and colleagues in the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. The motivation of our paper is renewables are getting a lot cheaper over the past decades as the International Re Renewable Energy Agency and Bloomberg New Energy Finance reported from 2010 to 2019, the cost of a solar PV has decreased uh, by 82%, and the wind cost has decreased about 40%, and that of uh, storage roughly 88%. However, many recent studies and reports around the world have not adequately captured such dramatic decrease. As exemplified in the IEA's flagship report, the World Energy Outlooks uh, consistently underestimated the speed of uh, global solar uh, energy expansion. EIA is not doing any better in its international energy outlooks, as you can see here. So, we are very curious to ask the research questions that how would the power system change using China as an example if the renewables and storage cost trends continue? And what are the impact to uh, power cost of those changes? How those changes would affect China's regional power system development, including uh, the power sector infrastructures? In order to answer those research questions, we use the Switch China model to do our analysis. A Switch China model is a part of the Switch model family. Switch is a, a capacity expansion model that runs at hourly temporary resolution and the provincial uh, special resolution to incorporate the impact of a variable renewable energy. It op uh, optimizes the investment decision by minimizing system our power system costs on the demand, technological, and operational, and policy constraints. So we designed four scenarios. The business as a year scenario, the BAU scenario assumes wrap, um, the conventional uh, renewable cost, and the low-cost renewable scenario, the R scenario, assumes rapid decrease of uh, uh, renewable costs as projected by Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and um, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. In addition, the C50 and C80 uh, each has a carbon constraint. In the C50 case, assumes 50% of uh, uh, emission reduction on 2015 level by 2030. Uh, C80 assumes an 80% of reduction. Here is the renewables and the storage costs, uh, be, uh, the differences between the BAU scenario and uh, other three uh, scenarios. So the key results of, of our study, first is the impact to capacity and the generation mix. As expected, rapid decrease in the cost of renewable and storage lead to the large expansion of uh, solar and wind uh, in the R scenario. Under the R scenario, coal-based generation would decrease from 4,900 terawatt hour in the BAU scenario to about 3,700 terawatt hour by 2030, a uh, 30% of a reduction. Wind and solar generation would provide 39, about 40% of the electricity demand with battery storage and natural gas supplementing the increasing wind and solar uh, supplies. Plus, hydro and the nuclear, the non-fossil generation would reach 62% 
in uh, 2030 in the R scenario. As of uh, as a comparison, the uh, current uh, discussion of uh, 2030 China's non-fossil electricity goal is uh, at about uh, 50. Relying on variable wind and solar resources for electricity would pose uh, challenges to system operation. On days that uh, abundant wind and solar uh, resources, up to 300 gigawatt of storage would be needed to balance uh, the variability uh, under the R scenario. New transmission infrastructure is needed to bring wind and solar energy from the lost west uh, to the center and central and the eastern demand centers. The necessary transmission capacity could be as great as 35 gigawatt, which would double the current maximum interprovincial transmission capacity. Power costs would decrease from about uh, 30, uh, $73.5 dollar per megawatt hour under the BAU scenario uh, to about uh, $65.1 dollar per megawatt hour under the R scenario uh, with an about 11% reduction. What's more striking is China's power sector could cut half of its uh, carbon emission uh, in 2015 level at a cost about 6% of uh, lower compare, compared to the uh, BAU scenario. So this is quite uh, encouraging. This is mainly driven by replacing the fuel cost of uh, uh, coal power plants. We also conduct activity as of 20% uh, higher renewable costs and storage costs and 20% of uh, uh, higher of a demand in 2030. Uh, the generation makes for a similar pattern, uh, though at a different magnitude. Uh, for sure, there are uncertainties uh, on where the cost trends uh, can sustain or uh, the scale of uh, infrastructure uh, needed to deliver the outcome is unprecedented. Um, um, there are also technological lock-in effects of existing co capacity and other technological, uh, operational, environmental and policy uh, uncertainties. Uh, the main take-home message of uh, our uh, paper uh, first uh, is the rapid uh, decreasing of uh, renewable and storage costs uh, during the past decade, which has a larger impact of the power system. And if these con trends continue, our results show that about 82% of China's electricity could come from non-fossil sources by 2030 at a cost that is 11% uh, cheaper than uh, the B BAU uh, scenario. And China's power sector could cut half of its 2015 carbon emissions at a cost about 6% lower compared to the business as euro scenario. Uh, our uh, main contributions um, in this paper is it reveals the implications of a cost decrease on power systems and offers new perspectives on the clean power transition. It also demonstrates the impact of fast cost decrease of a renewables and storage source uh, that a scenario that could apply uh, to the United States and other countries. Uh, it also reveals fast decarbonization is both technologically feasible and economic uh, beneficial, which offers the prospect of a large emission mitigation with a global environmental impact. We are glad that to see IEA updated its assumptions in its newest World Energy Outlook 2020, and similar results can be founded in the studies of the U.S. power sector. Uh, that's all about uh, our uh, paper. And if interested, here are a few related papers that uh, at my research group uh, collaborations are very welcome. I'll stop here and welcome any questions for discussions. Thank you. Thanks, Gong. It was a, um, it was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, I'm here for uh, addressing any <laughs> remaining questions. Right. Um, so let, let me see if there are questions on the Q&A section here for Gong. Okay, one question from Jay. A very interesting paper. Um, what were the effects on retirement rates for coal power producers? Mm. The question is very important. Um, so uh, first, we assume all uh, coal power plants that uh, 
they would uh, retire uh, when uh, reaching their uh, lifetime. But uh, given this high decrease of coal uh, power, uh, many coal power plants would uh, uh, retire earlier than their uh, life age. So in in that case, we show uh, that uh, you, you look at the percentage, uh, it's roughly uh, 65 to uh, 70 percent now, uh, it has to decrease in, uh, to about uh, um, 30 to 40 percent. Uh, that's the scale of the um, uh, retirement rate. Okay, any more questions for, uh, for Gong? Okay, uh, one question from, from Kara. Um, why does cost increase so drastically at C80 relative to C50? What is the inflection oh, point? Uh, mm. uh, actually, the cost, actually the cost assumption for, for the uh, renewables and the storage are all the same in the uh, lower cost renewable uh, scenario and the C50 and the C80 scenarios. So the the cost of a review because we want to test uh, if what uh, how aggressive the cost mitigation can achieve on with the um, renewable scenarios and what's the carbon uh, cap impact to uh, the system costs. Uh, what is the inflection point? Uh, the cost driven um, mostly uh, the expansion uh, um, of uh, uh, renewables, uh, but at the same time, I understand the impact of uh, nuclear, which has a uh, quite a large, in, uh, sensitive, uh, quite uh, sensitive to the system. Uh, right. So uh, we uh, did uh, uh, assumption that the renewable, uh, the, the nuclear uh, energy would uh, uh, make uh, uh, the maximum. Uh, uh, expansion by 2030 uh, at uh, 120 gigawatt, which is already quite uh, um, uh, large. But at the same time, uh, nuclear is uh, is where the uh, uh, the potential impact come from because uh, uh, let's say of 80 gigawatt of nuclear versus uh, 120 uh, gigawatt of nuclear would have a larger impact uh, because. Uh, nuclear runs on a higher capacity factor. If uh, basically, if one uh, gigawatt of a nuclear expansion it would reduce about uh, four to five times of, of the capacity of uh, uh, renewables. Right, right. 